Welcome to the 13th video on ancient Rome and part three of the Roman Kings. And this will sort of wrap things up for the Roman Kings because in the next video we will start to deal with the Roman Republic. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, the last three Roman kings were Etruscan. And so it is worth talking about the Etruscan civilization before we get to the last three Roman kings. Now, if you take a look at that map on the right there, you can see the spread of Etruscan civilization. And if you take a look at those dates there, the dates between 750 and 500 BC, that roughly equates, of course, to the time of the Roman kings. So as you can see here, the Etruscans were the dominant civilization in Italy during the time of the Roman kings. Now, the origin of the Etruscans is pretty much unknown to history. It is lost to prehistory in a sense because we really don't know where they came from. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus will relate that he thought they came from Lydia, which of course is in modern day Turkey. But really historians don't have a lot to work on. There's no literature or original texts that we have from the Etruscans. Most of the information that we know about the Etruscans is derived from tomb findings. But one thing is certain, there was an increasing Etruscan influence on Rome, and that is pretty much confirmed in archeology. span In fact, that influence was so great that many historians consider Rome to be almost an Etruscan city rather than a Latin city. Now, if you take a look at that map again on the right, you can see that the Etruscans were pushing south. And of course, this area right here represents kind of the Latin League as it became later on. Of course, Rome throughout time has been seen as a Latin city. And as you can see, they are on the edge of Etruscan civilization. So it's not just as simple, again, as Rome being a Latin city. The Etruscans also had a huge and lasting impact on Rome. So it's almost like a hybrid. They're almost a mix between Latin culture and Etruscan culture. So both cultures had an enormous influence on Rome. Now, the Etruscans, like the Romans and like other areas in Italy, were influenced greatly by Greek culture. And one of the big impacts was architecture. And the Etruscans themselves became great builders. And so the Etruscans undoubtedly had a great impact on Rome in terms of architecture. Now, the Etruscans also had a league, kind of similar to the Latin League. They also had their own league called the Etruscan League. And there were 12 main cities that comprised the Etruscan League. But no one city dominated it, and that is contrasted by Rome, who came to dominate the Latin League. And this is probably why the Etruscans ultimately failed to take over Italy and form their own empire, similar to what Rome did. Now, that lack of unity proved to be a big problem for the Etruscans, because they found themselves in between the Gauls in the north and the Romans to the south. And so eventually their culture and their way of living was destroyed almost completely. But as I said, they had an enormous influence on the Romans. So parts of their culture were preserved, in a sense, by the Romans. And so after 500 BC, which roughly equates to the formation of the Roman Republic, the Romans will gradually defeat the Etruscans. And as we know, the Romans will become the dominant player. Okay, so let's move along here. And the fifth king of Rome was known as Tarquin the Elder. Now they call him the Elder because his son eventually became king as well. And we'll get to him in a few slides. So there are two Tarquins. And as I mentioned before, he was an Etruscan. Now there is an interesting legend associated with Tarquin before he became king. Legend has it that while Tarquin was in Rome, an eagle swooped down and took his cap off his head. And then the eagle returned it back upon his head. And you can see that in the drawing on the right. Now this was interpreted as a good omen, an omen which would predict his future greatness. Now Tarquin became good friends with the previous king, who was of course Ancus. And after Ancus died, Tarquin played a little bit of a trick here. Tarquin advised the sons of Ancus to go on a hunting trip, and while they were on that trip, he indicated he would take care of things. Well, he did a little bit more than that. He asked the people of Rome to elect him as king, and they immediately did that. Now, Tarquin did some interesting things here. He increased the number of the Senate by 100, and actually he had the support of quite a few of the Etruscans that were in the city of Rome at this time. Tarquin is also associated with Roman games, and specifically he built the Circus Maximus, which of course would become the site of the chariot races that the Romans loved so much. Now, Tarquin also had to face some external threats, specifically Specifically, he had to fight the Latins, and he even had to fight off his own heritage, the Etruscans. Eventually, he was able to prevail in all of these battles because Tarquin proved to be a pretty good military leader. He was able to increase the size of the cavalry, which aided him greatly in his victories. 
Now, one problem Tarquin had throughout his reign was the sons of Ancus, and they had never really forgiven Tarquin for the manner in which he became king, and so they put out a contract on him, and finally one of those assassins was able to kill Tarquin, and it was quite bloody. One of the assassins snuck up behind him and struck him in the back of the head with an axe, and so it was a bloody end for Tarquin, and that would pave the way for a new king. And that was Servius Tullus, who became the sixth king of Rome. Now, Servius became king in an unusual way. He was appointed king by Tarquin's widow, so he was not elected, and that was something that was kind of a shadow over the rest of his reign. Now, Servius is credited with doing many things, and he was one of the busier Roman kings. Now, whether it's all true or not, we have no way of knowing, but let's review some of them right now. Now, one of the things he did was divide the Roman people into tribes for tax reasons. Now, these tribes were organized by where you live, not by ethnic groups, so that's an important point to make. Now, one of Servius's greatest contributions was the census. And this involved counting all of the people of Rome and then dividing them into classes. Now, each class was divided according to their property. So the more property you had, the higher your class rating was. And the first census numbered around 80,000 Roman citizens. So you can see, even at this early time, the Roman city was growing. Now, in order to vote, you needed to own property. And so that was something else that Servius introduced. Now, the roots of Servius are unknown, but it is suspected that perhaps he came from slave origins. And so he had a rather humble beginning, and he simply just worked his way to the top. And that's one of the reasons he's often attributed as advancing the cause of the middle class, as opposed to the ruling patrician class. Now, you will remember when I did the video on the Roman legions, I talked about Servius playing a critical role in the early Roman army. He organized the Roman army and especially introduced early hoplite tactics. Now, of course, we know that that will change going forward when the Romans switch to the maniple, but you can learn about that in the videos that I did on the Roman legion. Now, one thing that is credited to Servius is the Servian Wall, but that is pretty much discounted by historians now because it's believed that that was built hundreds of years later, and we'll actually talk about the Servian Wall when we get to the Roman Republic. Now, it seems the daughter of Servius, whose name was Tullia, had ambitions of her own, and so she was involved with the son of Tarquin, and his name was Lucius Tarquin, and they conspired to overthrow Servius. And so Lucius summoned the Senate and began to attack Servius personally, and one of the things he used against Servius was the idea that he had been born of a slave. Now, Servius, who by this time was an old man, arrived at the Senate to defend his position. But Lucius had him thrown out of the Senate, and he was murdered shortly thereafter by Tarquin's men. And then, in one of the more bizarre incidents, his daughter Tullia drove her chariot over her father's body, which you can see depicted in the painting on the right. And so that paved the way for the final king of Rome, Lucius Tarquin. Now, as I mentioned, Lucius Tarquin was the son of Tarquin the Elder, and Lucius became known as Tarquin the Proud. That is how he is commonly referred to. And of course, he is the seventh and final king of Rome, and also the third Etruscan king. Now, of course, as we just talked about, he was not elected, but seized the throne in a coup. And so the Romans really did not see him as a legitimate king. And worse yet, it appeared to the Romans as though he was establishing a hereditary line of kings, and that was unthinkable to the Romans. Now, Lucius didn't get off to a good start. He started reducing the power of the Senate and eliminating any potential rivals to the throne. So domestically, he was a disaster. But his foreign policy was actually quite good, and what he was able to do was make Rome the leader of the Latin League. He also embarked on several ambitious building projects, so he would build several temples and roads and also improve the infrastructure. Now, it's interesting that it wasn't any act that Lucius did to undermine his throne. It was his son who, in the end, caused the revolution that eventually formed the Republic. And what happened was his son raped a woman named Lucretia. And by this point, the Romans had had enough, and the rebellion was led by a man named Lucius Brutus. And eventually he won out, and Tarquin himself was exiled as a result of this incident. And there was a lot of outrage in Rome, not only at that incident, but also the king. And so that brought an end to the line of kings in Roman history. And from that point on, the Romans would not tolerate the word king. And so you will see men like Julius Caesar avoid taking that title because they knew the Romans simply couldn't tolerate any idea of a king ruling Rome. 
And so in 509 BC, the Roman Republic is formed. And we will get to that in the next video.